want me to stay on and just repeat some of that stuff as long as we only we cover that in like 10 minutes. You're more than free to stay on as long as you want or to leave whenever you want. But we're going. Sure, shut up, Kyle. Shut up. Welcome to oh. Heavy... <laughs> Welcome to Heavy Hands. I'm your host, Connery. Which with me as always is Phil McKenzie. Oh. Sounds great. And he only said the second syllable that time. I could tell. Low? I just went very quickly through the word hello. Mm-hmm. Kyle McLaughlin is also here. Uh, shorty got low. That's oh what. God. That's what we have to start about. over. This cannot be the beginning of the show. <laughs> but you don't like flow, right? I want the listeners to reply in the comments and say, "Tell me whether they knew that flow rider means Florida." Because I only found this out a couple months back. <laughs> That's how it's spelled. Yeah. yeah I, know, I, just, I just always read it as Florida. And he had a necklace that said Florida in the shape of Florida. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't looking at his necklace, was I? I was listening to his banging chains, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you find out what T.I. means, Kyle? It's going to blow your mind. Uh, it actually is, isn't it? <laughs> I guess that depends. Welcome to Heavy Hands. We have Kyle McLaughlin here already derailing the show. He comes on, you know, he's he's very, you know, uh, he's very insistent about punctuality, right? He comes on, and then what does he do? He talks about some anime bullshit with Phil for like 35 minutes straight. I swear to God, I could not get a word in edgewise. And then he comes and says, oh, by the way, I'm on limited time. Uh, we've been over this before, Connor. It is edgewise. <laughs> Fucking not <laughs> edgewise. And that's how you do it. What a twat, mate. Honestly. <laughs> anyway. Oh, I am punctual. I am punctual, yeah. We're punchable. Here. We're very punchable. Yeah, no doubt. We are here to talk about the biggest story in the world of heavyweight boxing in the last, dare I say, 500 years. Tyson Fury one of the best heavyweights in the world for the last decade, basically, the new Vladimir Klitschko, took on former UFC heavyweight champion and boneheaded business decision maker Francis Ngannou. And, um, you know, boys, I think, I think the, the prevailing feeling I had from this fight was that it, it was yet another reminder that heavyweights suck. Yeah, hundred percent. That was also <laughs> what I was thinking. I was like, we we let them do it to us again, didn't we? They keep getting us, Phil. They keep making us think rules apply. This can be looked at as a normal fight. Now, Kyle, I don't I don't know if you listened last week, um, but we we gave a very perfunctory preview. I mean, we basically said like this isn't that interesting to talk about because something crazy might happen, which it kind of did. But, like, one guy's a boxer, one guy isn't. It'll be way more interesting to talk about after the fact. Phil gave some pushback on that. But, Phil, was I not right? You are 100% It's right. a lot more I mean, interesting now, right? So, I mean, this was what I was thinking, is that, like, when I heard the car was coming on, I was thinking, to, like, uh, to at least some extent, like, this seems like it might be a little bit of a waste of Carl's time. <laughs> like, because there's, there's, there's not going to be that much to say. We can talk about, you know, the history of freak show fights or whatever. But, like, the fight itself is probably going to be, like, both ugly and one sided. Yeah. But instead, we got this, like, wonderful, uh, like, uh, coming together of, of, like, beautiful coincidences. Because we have Carl to talk on, talk about, like, what was almost, like, the biggest upset in like, recent combat sports memory. In, like, the last probably 20 years of heavyweight boxing history, if not mm -hmm. more. Like, uh, yeah, so Kyle, you're here to talk about this fight. First of all, did it defy your expectations? I'm guessing yes, but I, I did not hear what you had to say in advance. Yeah, to your earlier question, I actually didn't listen to the last week's episode, which is weird because I am a very regular listener i mean i maybe missed like one episode out of that, every five yeah. or something he but says that yeah I, I did miss last week's episode um and my thoughts were very much of and i think i said this on my own podcast uh which is if tyson fury comes in as he did in the third wilder fight which was physically unprepared mm. expecting a walkover um 
he should still do the job, but you know that's basically the only chance Francis Ngannou has got to make it uh, competitive. Then what we actually found was that Fury, I'm not going to talk too much about the fight straight off the bat, I'm going to go in my prediction first, but I think in my opinion we found out that Fury is both mentally and physically unprepared for this 100%, fight. 100%, uh, yes. Um, but basically, yeah, my thoughts were, and this is why I'm really impressed with Francis Ngannou, is that even the worst Tyson Fury should roll over Francis. And actually, if you look at Tyson Fury's uh, you'll know this as a chess man whether this phrase is correct or not, mm. Connor. But it sounds right. His opening gambit, mm. mm-hmm. which was the famous Fury uh, combo, uh, I say famous. It's one of his most off-used one, which is the jab, faint upstairs, jab down, whip the overhand over the top. He basically led with that, and I think he was going to try and take Francis Ngannou out in the first ten, twenty seconds. Mm-hmm. And very quickly found out, and I very quickly found out, about after about two minutes of the first round when he started complaining about the clinch, I went, ah, I've looked like a bit of an idiot here because mm. I haven't considered that, okay, um, I thought it was going to be route one stuff for Fury. And it should have been. The fact that I think we got to really straddle the line delicately here because I think a lot of people are going to think we're sort of excuse making for Tyson Fury but I really want to make this abundantly clear that Francis Ngannou even against the worst Tyson Fury should not have been able to do what he done this past weekend it's really impressive yeah um so yeah uh my opinion was very much that it was going to be a walk over Fury I said I said he should be able to get rid of Francis and Ganu inside of two rounds. Now, that was nothing to do with Francis and Ganu, and I, I did this silly voice in my podcast a lot, which is MMA versus boxing. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. And what, and what voice it, is that exactly? It's, uh, you know, the kind of dullard you would come across on, <laughs> on social media that would say, MMA can't stand up to boxing in stand-up fight. The, yeah. ty- the type of guy that <laughs> that try as you might, you can't quite seem to totally stop arguing with online. I might. mean, we've had this past weekend. We've had and now you have pictures of the knockdown against yeah. Fury. People go, see, this shows that boxing is a terrible form of self defense because Ngannou can just <laughs> jump on him and punch him on the floor. But okay, yeah, all right, we already knew that. Um, but yeah, um, basically, uh, my thoughts were that not two rounds because it's easy, but. That's the kind of round where Fury likes to drop the hammer. If you look at the Wilder, the second fight and the third fight, it's when he started really throwing the heavy artillery. Yeah. And I just thought that he'd have Francis figured out. He'd faint him out of his shoes, step round, create the angle. Francis would look really cumbersome and he'd just start peppering him and he'd overwhelm him. Because, you know, Fury is that level of fighter. And the fight that we had was vastly different. Mm-hmm. And um, the way I put it, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about the whole fight itself, but um, was that Fury let his sport down, whereas Francis really, you know, made mm-hmm. a great account of himself. And uh, you know what? This was very much Rocky one. Yeah. And in the sense yeah. that the loser comes out as 100%. the winner, you know, the moral victory, etc., proves himself. Um, I hate to use such a trite reference, but, you know, it really does feel that way. The heavyweights, um, and, and, you know, the, the champion comes out looking, uh, uh, you know, quite poor. Um, no doubt this was a, I, both a moral and a professional victory for absolutely, Francis and Ghana absolutely. I'm, overnight. I'm sure we talk about the fight and we'll talk about even the business side of it as well, because that's the narrative. The wild thing is, Connor, yeah, I don't think anyone's really distinctly made a case. You know me, on my podcast, I do like sort of fighter of the year across all combat sports. Mm-hmm. Um. And I think, you know, it's Francis Ngannou, isn't it? Because he, because of what he's achieved and because of the point that he's proven, that's worth more than level of opposition, achievement, you know, winning a belt, et cetera, et cetera. What he's done reverberates across combat sports mm-hmm. in a way that makes this so meaningful. So, yeah, I, like you said, it is actually way more interesting to talk about after the fact from a sporting perspective business perspective and just from a feel good story perspective really yeah and as always as phil and i noted at the top the the point that francis and gano proved and a, always always a helpful reminder is that you can't have too high expectations of heavyweights in any combat sport <laughs> that mm-hmm. like 
that this was just a much goofier showing from Titan. I mean, it, this so often is the case uh, with upsets, and this wasn't upset, even if Fury notched the decision. I mean, no question. Uh, Nganu netted a huge moral victory here. Uh, but as is all, so often the case, it was a combination of one guy vastly exceeding expectations and one guy completely failing to live up to expectations. I think it's a combination. And, 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 uh, I was a little surprised, honestly, to hear you say you thought Fury was going to get him out in two rounds because I, if I recall correctly, I think Phil and I said that probably he would box and try to tire Nganu out and maybe get him out of there later. And having watched this fight, I, I, that has not only reinforced my feeling that that would be the correct approach, but also that Fury probably would have won the fight if he had taken that approach. Because for so I just ev- jumping quickly, you might have another great Tyson Fury impression. Yeah. The reason I fought two rounds is a music fight looming, can't be getting marked up, cut, embarrassed. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And also, they send that bomb over from UFC to beat me. I knocked him out inside two rounds. You can just see it. Of course. Yeah. Fury, yeah. And you know, I think clearly he wanted, wanted to that. make a statement. I think he wanted that, and I think he completely overlooked Francis Ngannou. I think he thought he'd knock him out inside a round, and yeah. as soon as he went to clinch with him, yep. and, and, I, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to get bang on the analysis because I want everyone to have their go, but as soon as he started clinching, the, the thing with Fury is, and, and again, I said this on my own podcast, I don't want to say, oh, well, Francis has the MMA clinch, but it's very much a case of the Fury is such a yeah. good clincher for the heavyweight division as it stands... There's someone who's competent in the clinch, someone who's strong, someone who pummels for position really, really quickly. Frames and that cross safety faces. Blanket, uh, yeah. yeah, using the, and using it as a frame to create their own offense. This is very similar to why I picked Tyson Fury to beat Vladimir Klitschko all those years ago. Mm-hmm. Because Vlad was such a, uh, an oppressive clincher, mm-hmm. like an octopus. And I knew Fury, Fury so good in the clinch, he wouldn't have that usual safety blanket. He wouldn't have that avenue out when the range battle was too much for him. That's exactly the same as what happened there. Yeah. Fury didn't like the looks he gets at range. Oftentimes he will use throwaways to actually get in on an opponent and then either punch off the clinch or just use it to barrel into him, slow him down, tire him out. And about a minute in the first round, he's saying to the ref, he's older than me. And I thought, oh, he doesn't like the looks he's getting from range. Yeah. He doesn't like the clinch. Uh, he's fucked. Yeah, it's because he the ref was what he wants to do. the ref was cautioning Fury because the clinch was the first clinch break took ages uh, for the referee to get control of the fighters, and I think Ngannou was very much proving a point that Fury stepped in and tried to wrap him up, and Ngannou got a whizzer. We'll use the MMA terminology because this sure. is an MMA fighter, and he just held mm-hmm. on to it, and Fury was trying to separate, and Ngannou just wouldn't let his arm go, and I think he was trying to make a point like. This is not a safe area for you. And I had the exact same feeling watching it that the first clinch and the first time Nganu met that bum rush with a frame and threatened to uncork some right hands, I was like, ooh, I, I does, Fury does not look prepared for this. He did not look like he expected that, which is crazy to think, right, that he would have come into a fight with an MMA fighter. Maybe not one who's known for his wrestling per se, but somebody who has – we people who have watched his whole MMA career know is sort of a naturally good grappler and naturally good clinch fighter and is particularly accurate and dangerous when he gets a hand on his opponent and doesn't have I mean, to this is what this is one of the things we said on the on the podcast right yeah. is that like Francis started off his combat sports career in in France with no legal MMA there yeah like and that people, you know, and people didn't immediately say, you should go into boxing, you're a future world champion. Like, he wasn't, his natural gifts, you know, he hits obviously incredibly hard, Yeah. but I still don't think he's nearly as natural a boxer as he is, yeah, as he is a, a, a wrestler and a clinch fighter, you know, is right. famously he, you know, Kimmer and whoever it was uh, in one of his UFC fights, and he'd been, you know, practicing at the He'd he learned it in the, it locker, in the locker room, room beforehand. Was the, was the story, yeah, that he literally hadn't even done that technique before. Um, yeah, and but it's crazy to me that Fury, the uh, 
I suppose I shouldn't be surprised, but the arrogance of Tyson Fury was very nearly his undoing in this fight. Like, I just think he completely thought he was going to mop the floor with Ngannou. And again, from the glimpses we got of Fury's actual boxing game, you know, and what I mean is moving around, fighting positionally, fighting behind the jab. When he was doing that, he was doing fine. Like, Nganu does not have the defensive acumen to deal with that, and he doesn't have the footwork to deal with that. But Fury didn't go to it quickly enough, and then he couldn't seem to stick to it. He couldn't seem to let go of the idea that the jab was there to be built off of and to knock Nganu out. I think he was also surprised, as were the commentators, by Nganu's chin, that Nganu just ate mm-hmm. shots and didn't react. Uh, didn't show any wear or tear at all. But, uh, yeah, I mean, watching this, it didn't uh, change my mind at all that probably Fury could win this fight pretty comfortably if he just stayed disciplined and outboxed Nganu, and if a knockout would come. The, 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 Dylan White, the Dylan White tactics. You know, pop and move, yeah. build off the jab, and then eventually bring the up, bring it. You, you know, you keep jabbing him hard on the head, so he brings his head down, and you bop him with the uppercut six, seven rounds in. Yeah. Now we know Fury's a good puncher. I think Francis is an insanely durable guy. Yes, um, we, you know, that's a fact. But we also know that Fury is a, is a really solid puncher, and also it's his speed, it's his time, and it's running you on to shots. That's what accentuates that power. Yes, none of that work was in this fight the one time he really did it was just before he got knocked down he sort of doubled up on the jab then bopped uh, mm-hmm. Francis with a straight right and he went oh that pushed him back a little bit and then he got dropped and the mad thing is after he got dropped if you see him in the Wilder fights when he gets dropped he's back on him in yeah. this he was really happy to run the time out I think he just knew he didn't have his legs under him he hasn't been training he hasn't been putting the effort in uh, and he didn't seem to have I think maybe if they if if they had twelve rounds, maybe Fury would have shown that experience and and you know pushed late and would have had a you know maybe could have won a clearer decision. But um, uh, I think basically he looked he looked genuinely gassed. He looked like he yeah. trained for a one round demolition job. Yeah, and I think he was tense and he was burning too much energy and probably clinching with Francis was tiring him out more than he expected to because Francis was actually like offensively fighting him in the clinches. Um. So yeah, a huge shock. Yeah, I mean, I thought Fury looked. He looks. He looked kind of shot. Um, I think it's you. It might be like the preparation. You know, he said that he had like a twelve week training camp and so on. You know, difficult to say how much you can take anything that ever comes out of Tyson Fury's mouth seriously. Yeah, yeah. But like, if you just look back at like older fights, like, if you just look back at, like, Wilder 1, Fury looks like, I mean, uh, uh, you know, he looks much less fat, uh, but he just looks like he is on fast forward compared to what you saw here. Mm. And, yeah. Uh, he didn't yeah, look I mean, that great in that fight. You know, he didn't even look like he was at his peak fitness in that fight, so even that version, I think, was way better than this one, but yeah, you're absolutely correct. He looked slow. But yeah, I mean, I think, and I think, you know, on the one hand, it might be that he just didn't take his training seriously. On the other, it could just be that, you know, he's had a long combat sports career and he's done the thing of just ping ponging down, up and down in weight for, you know, so many times that eventually it it just fucks you up. You can't, you can't jump from being like 300 pounds down to, you know, dropping 40 and then putting, you know, doing the Christian Bale thing as an athlete. This Um, is heaviest weight of his career as well for a bloke that has mm -hmm. been obese on more than one actually i said you can mark the the quality of tyson fury performance by how far his shorts are falling down <laughs> oftentimes in his early career when he had to keep pulling his shorts up is when we get knocked over or he looked shit the first john mcdermott fight the nikolai Furfa fight i think the steve cunningham fight as well um and his shorts have been pretty good uh sort of waistband level for a while now and in this one lo and behold his <laughs> love handles are hanging out and he looks like shit You've raised a great point there, Phil. I actually said this on my own podcast, Combat Chronicles, uh, for anyone not already listening. We're um, going to edit that, that out. Cut that, cut that. No, please don't cut that. Please <laughs> leave that in. I'm desperate. Um, I think that there is a chance that it's not just poor preparation. 
it might be poor preparation because he he's had a long career and he really can't be fucked anymore. You know, his body can't do it. But I think it might just be a case of poor preparation. It's been 18 months since the Dylan White fight, but he looked absolute peak, you know, running on for the Wilder fights. Um, and, and bear in mind, he looked poor physically in, in the third Wilder fight, but mentally he was game for a fight. He was able to do everything you want him to. He, he looked absolutely brilliant in that fight, bar, you know, and, you know, getting into a knockdown drag up war with Wilder. Most people can't do that. You get you get nuked by a Wilder. You don't get into knockdown drag out wars with him. So even though physically he didn't look up for it, he looked very much himself. Um, yeah. White, you know, picked him apart, devastated him, looked, you know, peerless essentially. Uh, in a fight that some idiots thought Dylan White had a chance in, you know what I mean? So no, Fury's <laughs> levels above him. Then he fights Chisora last December, and it's a bit of a weird one because you think, well, it's a payday for Chisora, an old friend of Fury's. You know, they fought twice when they were when they were rivals, but they get on well nowadays. But actually, Fury looks like he's going for the motions a bit, but then when he does try to get rid of Chisora, he looks a bit ragged. His work looks a bit poor. So that's ten months ago. So we're saying really, it's eighteen months since Fury's been anywhere near his best. And the idea nowadays, of course, that, oh, well, you could just go on for longer because of nutrition, etc. This fella was 30 stone. This fella had years out of the game. We can't apply modern sports science and nutrition to this guy in the same way, because as you so brilliantly pointed out, Phil, and it's very much the, you know, sorry to use a fighter from a similar region who has had similar issues, but it's the Ricky Hatton effect. Yeah, exactly. Your legs will ditch you if you put them under this dress. And we've never seen a peak six foot seven, 20 stone fighter put their legs under duress. You know, Fury is very much. I mean, we saw Lennox Lewis do it, say, in the first Ratman fight when he was he had his eye on Ocean's Eleven rather than and he got knocked spark out and then he put things right. And, you know, and Lewis was just a bit burlier. Fury looked generally out of shape. And the thing was, when the going got tough, like it did in that third Wilder fight, Fury did the opposite to what we'd expect. He looked timid. He looked passive. He couldn't get the jab going. He kept doing, We know he can fight Southpaw and Orthodox. He wasn't doing this in a tactical way. He was doing it in a desperate way. And when Ngannou was piling it on him, we would expect Fury to fight fire with fire. He looked reluctant to do so. He looked like he knew his physical limitations. To see Tyson Fury backing up, to see Tyson Fury taking off the rest of the round, see Tyson Fury looking to clinch to get respite. Nah, sorry, not for me. Jonah Hill gif, you know, just stop it. He didn't look right. It, it looked, it was, it was concerning from a from a Fury uh, admirer, you know, someone who's watched him since his pro debut. I watched him and I thought. You don't look right. It's not just you're not taking this seriously. You don't look right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I, I do think that like it was as as it always is. It's always like things about the fighter which have always been there, which suddenly come to the forefront in a in a surprising way. I think that's that's always sort of the recipe for for upsets. Because I think, firstly, it's I think it's how dependent Fury is on foot speed as defense and, and, and um, like foot speed and, and length. Cause he's, you know, remarkably fast and big and a lot of his, I think a, a lot of that, you know, going for the, the uh, like the one, one, two at the start, a lot of that is about, implanting the like the fear of what he's going to do from range against people because the the Klitschko fight we me and Connor recently had the pleasure of rewatching <laughs> this fight and it's it's oh, fucking work. atrocious like it's but he did it's, everything he needed to do sort of I mean he's, he, he wins by like two punches around uh yeah. he's like he's like landing four punches and Klitschko's landing two um but like it's the idea that they're both just kind of uh, it, it, a lot of it is a sort of staring and fainting match where neither of them are committing to too much, and Klitschko is too planted to chase him down, and uh, Fury is uh, and Fury is is just like unwilling to come in if he's not sure that the opponent is biting on, on what he's doing. So there's just a lot of like not happen, not a lot is going on, and basically Fury spends a lot of the rest of the end of the fight, he just dives in for clinch, clinches and then 
he'll uh he'll whack uh, occasionally he'll like whack uh Klitschko on the break and that's where like a lot of his scoring offense towards the later rounds comes in and like the same and uh, against Wilder who like is your best Ganu um like parallel uh, uh, yeah ca- counterpart like the difference is were that like firstly like Wilder was just incredibly aggressive the whole time i think he was just forcing fury to fight and secondly that he just couldn't he just got knackered in the clinch like particularly in that in that in that third fight uh so he just he sort of just forced fury into a war i think it wasn't necessarily that like fury was any like would have approached it any any differently if he had to but it was just that wilder kept just throwing himself into fury until he kind of self-destructed whereas in this one a lot of Ngan- what Nganu did was he just stood there and aimed for a same time counter mm-hmm. because I found myself thinking like uh, pretty much I'm sure what you guys were thinking like in the second or third round is I was looking at Nganu and I was like he is standing like a boxer he is but we I know that he is not really a boxer like Fury is going to crack his defense open, you know, like a uh, like a lobster. He's just gonna once he starts throwing punches into this, like with any degree of volume, he's going to crack Francis open. And yeah, it was that it was that knockdown, I think, to, for me, because Francis just stood there. He waited for what you know. He has just a, he does have a good natural sense of timing. He's obviously like always been a a, a natural counterpuncher, mm-hmm. but. He just waited for what he was sure was the same time counter and then just threw a big punch and knocked Fury over. And you could just see after that point, I think, that Fury was just like, I can't let that happen again. I've got to fight this guy in the safest way possible. And that doesn't and that and it 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 didn't mean just like burying him under punches because he was constantly like he kind of wasn't really gonna slip the punch most of the time. He wasn't gonna like defend. He was just going to try and throw something at the same time, I think. And I just think that, like, Fury just, against someone who was, you know, approximately the same size and who was just waiting for that, he just couldn't bring himself to just to just drown him. Um, so yeah, Francis was really timing that. He was looking to time Fury's backhand with a left hook, which is a really yeah. nice counter. Freddie Roach always advocates for that, for rolling with your opponent's right hand, and as you roll with it, bringing your left hand over. Really nice as a, a body shot counter. Obviously, it's really risky. You've got to have yeah. you know, decent enough time and reflexes. There's just full-on durability to do it. Francis has got those things. But he also did that against Stipe just before he knocked him out in the second fight. Stipe threw a sort of long right hand with no setup, and Francis just rolled with it and brought the left hook counter over, basically throws it over his man's right shoulder um, as they're coming in to sort of maximise the power. He was looking for that from sort of first round onwards against Fury, and lo and behold, in an exchange, boxed him with a left hook. And drops him on his ass. And I tell you what, Fury is usually open to right hands. I don't. Nikolai further hurt him with a left hook, but I don't remember. Uh, obviously, Wilder hit him with a with a left hook as well. But outside of Wilder, most of his knockdowns have come from shorter fighters hitting him with an overhand right cross counter, which again mm-hmm. also utilised this fight as a kind of get away from me move. If you try and jab at me, I'm going to hit you for cross counter. And and Fury conceded ground, which is not like him. You know, he really did like give up. Uh, space and then Ganu was then like like you say oh fine I've got a bit of breathing room now you've got a guy who's carrying needs a lot of oxygen to carry those muscles around you're not using the volume you're known for you know drowning people in volume and I think it's because Fury didn't have that safety blanket of the clinch yeah he didn't have it um, yeah I mean that's the thing like I think I think Jack's yeah Jack Stack uh, he said he was doing a uh, super cut of uh, Fury Wilder clinch entries and quickly like he said he said you run out of the the Twitter video limit in before round four like for just for the entries not for like clinch exchanges but yeah like so much of is is it has been like a physical question of whether he can overwhelm people from you know knacker them in the clinch or he's too fast on the outside but this time he looked he looked slow on the outside. Yeah, and 
you know, and, and the, the the clinch just was not the right place to fight Francis Ngannou, even okay. if, you know, even if Fury had been physically in his prime, I think it's, it's not the, you know, it's not the optimal place to fight Francis Ngannou because he's, he's just, yeah, and it's, used a, to it there. it's another heavyweight sucks point. This is a bit like mm-hmm. Cyril, Cyril Gaon being exposed, um, for like, but, but Fury shouldn't be on this discussion though, should he? He has let himself down. Well, but what I, what I mean to say, really good. what I mean to say is that Fury is genuinely a good in fighter by heavyweight boxing standards. Mm-hmm. And that the vast majority of heavyweight boxers, he, I mean, literally everyone, um, doesn't have any wrestling skills. Like Fury is the guy who is using frames and getting head position and finding angles. Like all of these wrestling skills are applicable to boxing, but, um, across a lot of the sport, these skills are not as commonly taught or practiced as they were like 50 years ago. You know, there used to be a lot more. And even before that, Kyle, you know, like in the bare knuckle era, half of a boxer's training camp were wrestling sparring partners. They needed yeah, to. Yeah, even, even, even into, you know, into the early golf era, you know, Jack Johnson, Bob Fitzsimmons, Jim Jeffries. 100%. All, they trained all wrestled with, and clinched a lot. They trained with wrestlers. And um, there are a few guys who do that, you know, like Vasil Lomachenko has a wrestling game and Terrence Crawford has a wrestling Absolutely. background and it shows up in these guys' fights. But... Um, Fury was the only guy in the heavyweight division with some any boxing relevant wrestling skills. And what we found out here I think is that uh those the value the the uh the the quality of those skills was exaggerated by the fact that his opponents had none. <laughs> yeah. None of the heavyweights he's been beating in the clinch know how to clinch for them when they fight each other. It's like in so many other boxing fights. It's just a place where you wait for the ref to separate you. I will say, I did expect this to knack a Francis Ngannou. And it did. I was and genuinely shocked and impressed that it didn't. Because I was 100% expecting the Connor Floyd thing to happen. Because it's not, yeah. you know, it wasn't just that Francis is naturally better. You know, he's not just that he's better in the clinch than, than uh, a boxer would be. But just due to the fact that, you know, it's a boxing ring. It's something that you're never used to and uh, a professional boxing fight. And that is something which drains you like yes. just being in weird situations, you know, having clenches broken up all the time and then restarted and all this other kind of, and the, the way the time is divided up all this kind of stuff, like takes a mental toll on people sure. and which tends to sap their gas tank. So I will say that like, even though I'm being like, well, I never should have clinched with that. I'm like before the fight, I was a hundred percent like, He's going to clinch with Francis. It's going to knacker him. It's going to tire Francis out. He's going to get cornered because he's not going to be used to it. So I mean, it's just like it's a tremendous credit to uh, Francis's like mental, du- both durability and kind of mental adaptability to be yeah. able to be in that kind of alien alien situation, and this was... and then still just keep his uh, and yeah, still just keep himself together. Yeah, and this is the other thing, the difference between them, I think, is that Tyson Fury um, did a terrible job adapting. He mm-hmm. uh, he seemed to, like, even after the knockdown, there were, like, minute, maybe minute and a half windows where he was doing, you know, what I thought he should have been doing, like fighting positionally, jabbing, uh, exposing Nganu's footwork, which really wasn't much for most of this mm-hmm. fight. As you said, Phil, he just stood there for a lot of this fight waiting for for Fury to make a move but Fury just seemed um planless almost after the first round or two when it he sort of felt what it was like to clinch with Ngannou he felt what it he was disappointed to see that Ngannou could just shrug off his best shots of which he landed plenty in the very early going mm-hmm. um and then he seemed like he you know and his his coach said to him in the corner you're you're doing way too much. Like you're working too hard. I think his coach wanted him to just go back to basics and just outbox Francis, which worked when he did it, but he that's the thing is he couldn't seem to stick to it. Like he couldn't seem to accept that he was just going to have to fight a disciplined fight and beat Francis Ngannou that way. Which 
for all that Floyd Mayweather fought against type in his bout with Conor McGregor, and we're not used to seeing him pressure that much, he didn't completely overlook McGregor. He took him seriously and respected him and built up to the finish that he got in that fight very methodically. You know? Well, yeah, that's I think that is the the key point is that Floyd actually took the optimal path to win. Yeah. So he was like, I might get clipped by this guy and I would look like a moron. So I'm going to I'm going to even throw away early rounds. Then as the fight goes on, I'm simply going to wear him down and put him on. It the was back not foot. an arrogant performance from Floyd. Yeah, it was it was the right. It was simply the correct approach for the fighter in front of him. Yeah. But the thing. Yeah. Fury didn't ha- seem to have a a plan for wearing Ganu out apart from clinching with him. And also, yeah, it's just it was just like I think Francis's chain adaptations that he came with were just more than he expected and it just utterly threw him off. Like body work, you know, everyone Yeah, you hit the body. Everyone was lot. mocking the like the Tyson stuff with good reason. I don't think this looked like this looked like Mike Tyson at all. But that was exactly what he should be doing. And yeah, I think it was just a a slow fury who couldn't get out of the way and then was just like couldn't figure out how to safely create exchanges. But the issue was that obviously the safest thing to do would have been to like beat Francis and Ngannou up. Yeah. So, I mean, what do we think of Francis and Ngannou going forward? We, obviously, we've talked a lot about Fury because at least half of what happened here is Fury – getting old and fucking up. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are thinking with good reason that PFL may have just lost a star competitor. That's yeah, have. probably never, Francis he, Ngannou. He never fought in MMA again. There's no need to. Right. I mean, no, like, he should, nor shouldn't. Yeah. Nor, I mean, do we need to see him fight? I mean, is it Phil DeFries? Yeah. yeah look, look, oh. He's, he's either going to, he's either going <laughs> to fight Fury again. He's going to fight the fight. He's going to fight the Fury Usyk winner. He's going to fight Wilder, which I think all three of us would agree is basically the best fight you can make in boxing that isn't Usyk Fury. Uh, um, yep. And and given Fury's uh, our, our reservations about Fury's potential uh, form, it might actually be you know better in terms of a sporting contest as well. I still pick Wilder by first round KO because I basically pick by first round KO against everyone. But that famous phrase that we all love to use unstoppable object versus the uh, immovable yeah. force or whatever it is no, the unstoppable force versus <laughs> the immovable object Something that like famous that. phrase that I got wrong um, that's very much what that fight is and if not they talk about AJ in Africa uh, it will never happen but uh, in Ganu versus AJ uh, yes please I would love to see that um, yeah Francis and Ganu the, the, the reason the way I think about it is like this yeah if you were to pick Fury as absolute worst against, say, some random top 25-ish heavyweight, or maybe worse, someone that Fury's already fought, someone like Tom Schwartz, that he absolutely dominated, um, you know, and basically made a mockery of it, you would still pick Fury to beat him comfortably, okay? So that basically means you're saying France and Gannou, he didn't beat comfortably at that poor form, is a top 20-ish heavyweight. Yeah. He also looks the part. He has the cachet, and this is really interesting as well. I'd love to hear what they said on the ESPN commentary, Connor, because over here uh, on TNT Sports, which is a subsidiary of uh, Discovery Plus. Well, I've um, watched they, I watched the DAZN broadcast with British commentators, oh, right, so okay, it may have fine. been the same on, team you okay. have. Right, okay. Well, basically, what's really interesting is Dana White has fucked Francis Ngannou off, but because that broadcast... Uh, team on on Discovery Plus, uh, sorry TNT in the UK also shows UFC. Every single time they spoke about Francis Gary's background, MMA was not mentioned. It's he's a UFC fighter. Mm-hmm. So Dana White fucks and Gary off and still gets free publicity for it. Oh, this is from his background in the UFC. Uh, you know, in no, not even in the UFC. In UFC, like it's the name of the mm-hmm. sport. Yeah. Somehow gets the fucking rub when he doesn't deserve well, it. Like um, this. Yeah, basically. Let this be the final nail in the coffin. Uh, I think uh, one of the co-main event guys said this. Maybe it was uh, it was folks that let this be the nail in the coffin of the notion that Dana White and the UFC are good at promoting fighters because Francis Ngannou is clearly more, yeah. a special star athlete, mm. and because he wanted to be paid as such, they just let him walk, and now he has instantly become 
one of the most important people in boxing. And what yep. looked like and just yeah. a... you could have kept him, let him have the fury fight. Yeah, gave that, him didn't like you did it with McGregor, but they didn't. And now want... you've got him. Yeah, you've got him back, and you say our guy, our champion, just went over the boxing and got robbed against the best boxer yeah. of the generation, and suddenly you look like a fucking genius. Of course, do it, yep. but they didn't but, want another but he's McGregor. Not a genius. Yeah, because they. Yeah, because you know. Dana White, Dana had a bee in his bonnet against him. Now they can never co-promote because, uh, a, for multiple reasons, it will make them look like they're backing down, and they don't want to look like giant pussies. Uh, and that's actually probably more important to them than making money. B, I reckon Dana still wakes up in a cold sweat from the time that he sent uh, Chuck over to Pride <laughs> and bet money on him. And uh, Rampage uh, elbowed his organs into puree. <laughs> like, and then, and then and then Dana said, "Well, we've brought a big uh, team over, lots of resources, so uh, we're gonna let Rampage use them now instead because it's based on well, we might as well make him look good. So if he wins, mm-hmm. it, they go. But well, the guy that beat our guy was the guy that won it all, and everyone one day still fucking need his head into <laughs> Rose's head." Um, um, but but also as well, what I really want to say about Francis Gani, which is great. Um, and there, there's so much, you know, I know they were sort of geeing each other up before the fight, but there was a lot of respect between Fury and Gani. You could tell yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely subsequent to the fight, Fury was like, you know, look, this guy, fair play to him. Because I think Fury, his heart of hearts, goes, fair play to that man. He gave me, he, I mean, he shouldn't have been able to give me that fight, and he did. 100%. But Francis Ngannou has carried himself, as we all know him to be, as MMA fans, as a gentleman with grace, um, with you know respect um handled the loss which he would have had absolutely absolute justification to take serious umbrage with um he took it so well and yeah basically he's become like the people's champion overnight because as you said connor he is a special athlete he is a special man I think, you know, OK, we thought he'd be quite cumbersome. But at times he looked a bit cumbersome. Mm-hmm. And we thought he was quite wild. And at times he looked a bit wild. But actually, uh, exceeded. look, I've watched all of his bouts in the UFC and obviously watched fights, you know, bits and pieces before that. And, you know, his kickboxing bout and that. He completely blew my expectations out of the water. And I know we joked about the Mike Tyson thing. I don't think it's... Uh, I think people thought, oh, he's going to be fighting like Tyson. That's what he needs to do. I mean, Tyson's just sharp enough to, A, it was a market thing, but also just yeah. just keep ticking over. Keep him sharp. Keep him, you know, don't overthink things. And the fact that Francis had the poise and the uh, uh, sort of the ability to keep himself to sharp, in as, as you guys have alluded to, a really stressful situation yeah. for a fighter. You know, that sort of poise is so huge amount uh, of pressure. I mean, it's an inherent it's an inherent uh, ability that you can't teach. Yeah. That self-belief, self-confidence. Look, I would think that Wilder would just bang him out inside around because Mm -hmm. he's got it Wilder. And basically it's a shootout. One guy's faster and probably hits harder. You know, that's that's just not. And undoubtedly, as as we saw in this fight, the thing that this is which should be no surprise to anyone, the thing that Nganu has to learn the most of boxing is defense. Yeah. Especially to the, especially defense to the right is bad end. because he's an yeah. MMA fighter. But even but, that, even that got well, better over the course of the fight as he sort of got his second wind and settled down. Even then he started to see shots coming. So I think there is genuine potential for Nganu to continue building. That's what on. I'm saying, Connor. Like even if I pick Wilder to beat him, I'm just saying, like yeah. now I'm saying, okay, it's a genuine fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. Like he can fight any of these guys. Uh, he could up. fight. He could fight all of them. Watch it. He could lose all of those fights, and this would still be. And uh, Tyson Fury can go on to look like absolute shit for the remainder of his boxing career and retire. Yeah, and this would still be an absolutely stunningly remarkable achievement. And he's going to get more than like... a million dollars each time he does it. Like. Yeah, well, yeah, mate. He's some, gonna, for his next fight, he'll get ten, fifteen million easy. Yeah, yeah. As, as someone said, it's like it's a real shame he couldn't get fifty k performance of the night bonus. For <laughs> oh yeah, that was a great tweet. <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
But to be fair, if he if if he'd been robbed like that, Dana would have given him his show and win money. To be fair, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, would, he would he would have got ten and ten for that performance. Yeah, he would have gotten a um, really sweet locker room bonus. But do you oh, know what? He, he's done himself. He's done himself such great credit, and he's done the sport of MMA a credit because actually, what he's shown people is bet on yourself. Don't be blackmailed. Don't be. And, and don't get me wrong. He has a leg up on people because he looks like a superhero and he punches you know, like Thor's hammer. Um, not everyone will have that for them. But, you know, you've got to think of someone like, you think of someone who isn't as aesthetically pleasing to watch from a combat sports perspective, like Danny Sabatello. Now, Danny Sabatello is not anyone's idea of like a particularly fun fight to watch, but he has marketed himself in a way yeah. that people know who he is. Now, what this shows is you might be innately talented or you might be innately charismatic. You don't need to be told that there's no other options for you because there are options for you. Look at John Dodson cut from the UFC. Seems to be in the twilight of his career. He is consistently earning, whether it's bare knuckle, whether it's over and rising, uh, you know, on the regional scene or whatnot. He is basically positioned himself as an attraction in this day and age. Even though there seems to be less serious competition out there in terms of other MMA promotions for the UFC, there are now with influencer boxing, with other MMA promotions, with just boxing, with bare knuckle, with all these different potential revenue streams. There are now more options for guys out there. And you don't need to be beholden to the fact that you're worried that the UFC are telling you, hey, we're the biggest show. If you really want to potentially you know, maximize your potential, you've got to be here. And for the first couple of years, you just got to make the sacrifices to make that happen whilst mm-hmm. we're getting big bonuses. Because at the end of the day, Francis Gano has showed you, actually, the grass might not be greener on the other side, but there is grass out there. If you want to go and graze, yep. you can do it. And that is great, as I say, fighter of the year, hands down, because from a sporting pers- uh, perspective, punches ticket in so many ways. But also... Everyone else has just looked at him and gone, you're a hero. And he really is. And I hate to come across this discussion. Usually no, I come no, no. on this podcast. I, I feel the same way. Cynical. I feel it's the great. same way. Yeah. Yeah. He, he took on the fucking the UFC machine and he showed, he, he not only did he win, he showed that it was possible to win. I thought he fumbled the bag though, Phil. That's what I heard. Oh yeah, of <laughs> course. Yeah, yeah. All, all those people, they were like, oh got yeah, he's injured. got this huge deal yeah. and he's going to, he's going to fuck it up with, uh, with this fight that again even if he'd gotten battered in would have been a giant win for his career because he would have earned more than his entire exactly. UFC career yeah. put together and now it's yeah. somehow he has leveraged that into basically a boxing career like yeah and he's now he's now basically the hottest combat sports ticket in the world yep um so, do you want to want to say anything about the the scoring i did i think i did score it for fury but the whole time i was i was i was laughing Oh, uh, I, yeah, I yeah me fun. too. I, I had a hard round time. One, round one was Fury's round. Two, yeah, yeah. Uh, might, might be Fury's round, might be spring round. Three was clearly Francis' round, but I thought after that, Fury won four, five, and six. Seven, I think, was the swing round, and then Francis won eight, nine, and ten, or maybe definitely nine and ten. Not really sure about eight. I actually said on my own. I thought it was podcast, eight. I thought eight was the one where he did super well, and then yeah, uh, yeah eight, and then eight, nine. Eight. I thought nine, he, nine and ten, he was falling off a bit. I yeah. couldn't give him. No ten, no ten. Francis, I think nine was when he backed Fury up and was all over him. Like even though like there wasn't much landing, like he was throwing punches and punches and looked like pretty yeah. good. And I actually said on my own I was going to rewatch it and rescore it, but I didn't get round to that. Um, and actually, the point I made is that it's one of those fights. Of we all say this quite a lot, but the actual round score and the, and the final decision doesn't matter. It really mm-hmm. doesn't matter. I know people will yep. go. But of course it matters because Francis could have beat the champion in his in his first boxing bout or whatever. It doesn't matter because the narrative is what has got everyone talking. Actually, yeah. it kind of works better for him that he was quote unquote robbed. Don't right. you think? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, a bunch of yeah. So me and Connor were talking about this before the the fight as well, and we were I was saying like it would be pretty funny if Tyson got if Tyson got knocked out, which was again the only way. Even the people who were rooting for Francis, I think, saw him winning this. Was him yeah. decking Tyson like? Winning on point, like potentially winning on points, unbelievable. But again, uh, and I was like, it would be funny. And then Connor was rightly, rightly said, but that would take the, uh, that might take the Usyk fight away. And you know, we've been chasing that for so long. And yeah, in many ways, this is the best of all outcomes because 
Fury Usyk is still on the table. People aren't going to be fighting for a, a rematch with between Fury and Ganu. Um, and yeah, and Ganu, Ganu gets to be the moral winner. Like people will love him mm-hmm. more for uh, like it's, quote unquote being robbed again. I can't. I think I, I, I scored it for Fury. I wasn't scoring, but it's, it is super, super like rigorously. But I do think like a lot of people were seeing, were giving Ganu lots of credit for and not giving fury credit for when he was landing and sure. yes. very cleanly yeah but um and as with all fight. of these yeah, yeah, yeah. uh as with all of these crossover fights like a huge amount of what you're seeing online the chatter is from mma fans not necess- well, like, just, and just from people who were like who were just super invested you know lots of boxers were like oh yes oh i'm not saying like, boxers robbed, weren't like, part of it but it, like this th- there there is a scaled up effect of what you get in like any mma bum that the jake the jake paul and logan paul guys mm-hmm. that, yeah, like, yeah. So mma fans really are like, really not really not by a lot of people they they want willing him to lose yeah, yeah, yeah there's yeah. that there's 100%. that too by the way i will say you made a great point earlier about Fury not liking someone who was like unclinchable and how like he didn't like it I'll tell you who's quite hard to clinch with that little Ukrainian middleweight he mm-hmm. doesn't seem to be very willing to fight that's another reason that maybe Fury didn't mind have done his tape study on Ngannou but he's definitely done it on Usyk and I think he's thought uh, he could jab with me he's a southpaw he's faster he's better defensive than I am he's got a better engine than I am and uh, he's pretty hard to fucking clinch and he looks pretty fucking strong with a really strong centre of gravity yeah uh, I'll just keep calling him middleweight and say that he's a bum and then I won't have to fight him um, but yeah I, I think it's I feel like sorry to go off the, the, go on. they really missed an opportunity to have just a constant picture in picture on Usyk's face he looked really pissed <laughs> off. Like when they were filming him, he was like, "Look, first and foremost, I'm trying to watch a fight. Secondly, can you watch the guys in the ring because they're in there giving it? I yeah. mean, they're about to have a fight." Or like, they should have put off. him on uh, commentary, like when uh, George Foreman fought the five guys in one night, and they had like Ali on commentary, Ali, yeah. like talking yeah, shit from <laughs> talking shit from the booth. <laughs> like... That's a great. I tell you what, that that just pulled a fantastic comparison out your ass. <laughs> <laughs> the way they perceived Foreman after that sham is very much how they're talking about Fury now. Yeah, it was supposed to be a uh, a rehab of his reputation or whatever, and instead yes. he ended up looking like a joke, even though he won all the fights. Yeah, he mm-hmm. looked somewhat deranged. He looked poor. He looked sloppy. And it's he like, started what dancing are you doing? like Ali why are you fighting, the fight. Why are you fighting all these bums? Like, what point are you trying yeah. to prove? That just goes to show, as you said, Kyle, that the narrative matters more than the decision. I, just to put my two cents in, I also did think Fury won the decision. I thought he picked up most of the rounds, but um, it is Rocky. And, like, people like those stories. Like, they like Rocky. It is a great sports movie arc that Nganu came in here and did better than anyone dreamed, and losing the decision almost makes it sweeter because it, it it's a very it's a bittersweet and therefore very memorable ending. Uh, mm-hmm. That yeah makes him uh, makes him a hero as I think he deserves to be <laughs> a heroic performance. All right. Well, let's wrap things up there, at least for this fight. Phil and I do have a couple of UFC fights to talk about after this. We won't spend too much time because it's more heavyweights, unfortunately. But, uh, Kyle, are you going to uh, stick around at all? Or, you, or I mean, we've spent 50 minutes here talking about this. So, What I'm, what I'm going to say to the listeners of this podcast is that I'm not going to stick around. But actually, we discussed Boo. the UFC heavyweight uh, main event for this weekend <laughs> in great detail prior to this. And Connor said, well, it's too much of an effort to edit around. So I'm not going to include your contributions, which we all thought were fantastic. So just <laughs> pretend that I offered something really interesting. Great. And uh, I guess if you want to hear me talk about fights, head on over to patreon.com slash combat chronicles. Follow me on Twitter at combat CR, et cetera, et cetera. I'll, t- I'll tell you uh, what, we, we heard Phil's uh, country bumpkin accent before. I feel I have newfound confidence that he can just sort of do your accent. Uh, and we'll just I've have got, him. I've sort got, of, that should be. That should be that should be really easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll just I'll have him replicate. Cool, cool blimey, Barry Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> We'll oh, just have him. <laughs> so me, we'll be the back. The 13th Duke of Wimborne here. In the <laughs> that is exactly me. My reputation. That's you, isn't that's, it? That's perfect. <laughs> so we'll be back yeah. with Phil and air quotes Kyle 
to talk about <laughs> Gilton Almeida versus Derek Lewis after this. Until then, a big thanks to Kyle for joining us. Um, thanks, man. Check out his podcast, Combat Chronicles. It's very good. The man does his research and he knows his shit. And hopefully we can have you back again soon, buddy. Hopefully it's Safa uh, Usyk Fury, December 23rd. Yeah. I don't care what anyone's saying. There is a legally binding contract. Let my boy have his fight. Let's plan on it so that we can be disappointed together. Uh, Hooray. All right. Yeah. We will be back after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. All right. Welcome back to the show. Thank God that's over. No agreement. Phil, you're still on. Kyle's gone. You're supposed to be back on my side now. Hmm? No, no, I was just missing Kyle. I was just <laughs> gently, like, I was looking at my picture of him, uh, you know, thinking of touching his, it with one finger, his soothing mournfully voice. thinking of what it was like when we could gang up on you and teach you that... Uh, that it's not edgewise, edge, it's edge, edgeways. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Look, I'll grant you, okay, I'm a proud American. I'm basically Hulk Hogan, but I'll grant you, edgewise is a weird one because clearly edge ways makes more sense. We don't say, mm -hmm. we don't say sidewise. We say sideways. That is true. So, yeah. so I'll give you, there that are one. many, there are actually many examples where the Americans are unfortunately correct, but this is not one of them. I'll, I'll give you that one. We removed all the extraneous use, but I'll give you edge wise. <laughs> um, anyway, we're here to do, I think, just one more segment for this episode. We're just going to cram in whatever thoughts we have uh, about this upcoming UFC Fight Night card, which is um, pretty mediocre, if I'm being honest. It's got a couple highlights, even down on the undercard. I mean, we've got uh, Zaleski, uh, Elizu Zaleski is fighting uh, Renat Fakratinov. That's kind of interesting. Vitor Petrino is fighting Modestus Bukowskis. I think that could actually be a good fight at light heavyweight. Um. You know, I don't know, Lucas Alexander, I've, David Onama doesn't look like complete shit. It's not like it's devoid of meaningful contests, but it is not, um, it's not a great fight night card. I think it's, I think it's going to be a good fight night card. Yeah. I think for, There's a lot given that it's like matches. a live Brazilian event, I think it's going to have a good atmosphere. Most of the fights are some flavor of action fight. Yeah. Uh, with reasonably relevant people, mm -hmm. and I think I think it's it's actually got like the recipe for like a good. I agree. A a good fun like uh night out. I think the problem is is obviously that everyone is just at that certain level of relevance where yeah. you're like I know and am interested sort of in this guy, but there is no one that like makes you think, man, I've got to watch this card. Exactly. There's no, yeah. there is no standout like prospect or anything like that, that you would think, uh, yeah, I, I need to watch this guy's fights apart from obviously the, the second best middleweight. It's, in the a, world. it's a bunch of reasonable quality matchups that will almost certainly be fun to watch across the board. Uh, yeah. So I'll give them that, but uh, I don't have to talk about this whole thing. We don't have to do two whole segments. We could just slam it all in here. We've already spent an entire show talking about the most interesting fight uh, probably of the next few weeks. Um, yeah, that was uh, Ngannou Fury. So let, let's kick things off here talking about the main event of this, uh, this fight night card. That is, of course, a heavyweight bout between Jailton Almeida and Derek Lewis. And... Um, Boy, I wish Kyle had stuck around to give his thoughts. He didn't have anything to say about this fight. But yeah, what a bastard. What an idiot. Uh, yeah, it was when, when we asked him to talk about it, and he was just like, my time is worth money. Although, yeah. you know, he said it much more. He said, core blimey. Van Dyke and, and, yeah, yeah core, exactly. Core blimey, said, gov. And core blimey. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, he said gov a lot, like more than usual. Right? He seemed flustered. Mm. Yeah. And I think he nicked your purse, by the way, while he was <laughs> while he was doing that whole routine. I um, mean, you know, Fagin does demand it on things, so <laughs> So, heavyweights, Jalton Almeida, Derek Lewis. Um, I uh, I think, I mean, the pick here is obvious, but I think there are, some, there are some wrinkles to discuss. I think it may be time now that we're reaching that Cyril gone moment where we have to start evaluating how actually good Jalton Almeida is and how much his success has uh, entirely hinged upon the frankly poor quality of heavyweight competition um and this for all that i think the pick is obvious this could be the sort of exposing fight there is uh there is a smack of a prospect loss here for jailton almeida if things go in a very specifically wrong way for him yeah i guess i think there's basically one uh thing that i can think of that makes this fight remotely concerning Mm -hmm. and it's just size yeah like i don't think almeida almeida is not like a a huge heavyweight you know most of the time people were were thinking that he was going to be a light heavyweight yeah um he's not that big and Derek lewis is very big yeah i feel like this is the only, uh, and you know, obviously Derek Lewis can 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 punch hard. This is the only uh, possible uh, way that this fight does not go as predicted. Because I mean, unfortunately, we had the "is this guy actually any good?" discussion when we were looking at it through the other distorting lens of "is this guy actually good?" when we were talking about. Sergei Spivak versus Derek Lewis and Sergei Spivak versus Cyril Garn. Yeah. Which, again, something which uh, really uh, reinforces the d- multiple distorting layers of how terrible heavyweight truly is, because Cyril Garn looked like the worst grappler in the world against John Jones, and then uh, Sergey Spivak completely dominated Derek Lewis, and you can be like, okay, this guy's at least an okay offensive wrestler. No, he isn't. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the main problem is obviously that you don't need to be a good wrestler to beat Derek Lewis. I mean, sorry, you don't need to be a good wrestler to get Derek Lewis down. Right. What you need to be is a good offensive grappler. Many people have taken him down, and they have tied, and they have uh, tied themselves out. Uh, trying to keep him down and just like going for the seat belt when he's getting up and trying to pull him back down again and eventually knackering themselves. Yep. And Jelton Almeida, as he showed against Shamil Abdurakimov, when people get on four on all fours and try and stand up from the, from the ground, he can jump on their back. <laughs> yeah, and he is also just a much more fluid, comfortable. Uh, top position grappler and wrestler than the type of guys that Derek Lewis has um, has managed to 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 gas before. Because uh, mm-hmm. this is the other thing is that um, there there's a point to take in either direction from that Abdurakhimov fight that a lot of Almeida's opponents did what Abdurakhimov did there, and Daniel Cormier was talking about this on the broadcast early on. He was saying. They have the power to just sort of blast their way out of the position uh, because Almeida's small. I mean, he's the same height as Abdurakhimov. I think he's the same height as Derek Lewis. He certainly looked um, frame-wise like the same size as Abdurakhimov, but he's notably slimmer. He is a smaller man, mm-hmm. uh, and he is going to be even more notably slimmer and um, lankier, I think, than Derek Lewis. But um, what he did is he fully expected Abdurakhimov to try to fling him off. And rather than fighting that and rather than getting into a bunch of really taxing scrambles, um, he just sort of floated the position. He allowed him to create some scrambles. He didn't expend a bunch of effort. He just managed his posts, changed angles when he needed to, and stayed in top position. 
and won the scrambles more methodically by just not like going full tilt into them. It's not like we haven't seen Almeida get a little tired from grappling mm-hmm. with heavyweights. We have. But uh, he has a way of managing that. The other side of that, though, is that the Derek Lewis revolution, uh, which has never been technical, like the man hasn't made a technical improvement ever. Um, but the thing that made him such a top heavyweight mainstay for so long was that he recognized that this was a sort of suicidal approach to grappling against a certain level of grappler. Obviously, Almeida is better than all those guys that he struggled with. But it was the Zen approach from Derek Lewis, biding his time, having nothing in mind so much as the fact that every round would start on the feet, and the more rounds he got, the more chances he would have to do the thing Derek Lewis actually does well, which is bonk people. Um, So I think it could be a curious intersection of these two things, Almeida being ready in his approach for somebody to work way too hard and sort of planning to get them later, and Derek Lewis being willing, at least from what we've seen in the last several years, not to work hard at all. And is that, in fact, another kind of suicide when you're facing a grappler of the quality of Almeida? Yeah. I mean, I I think this is... My main issue is that, like, the problem with Lewis has not been the quality of wrestling needed because as yeah as Spivak proved the the quality needed is not high yeah the thing is that anyone with a smidge of genuine submission offensive threat has immediately tapped him yeah <laughs> primarily Spivak himself and uh, Daniel Cormier yeah, like because Daniel Cormier was you know a bad matchup, but it was also like people were thinking you know maybe he can survive the, um, you know maybe he can survive the takedowns and get some strikes off on the feet, do a bit of maybe what Anderson Silva did and so on. Yeah, but you know Cormier is actually a genuinely very good grappler. He's not just a a good wrestler. He is yeah he is and a, a student of the game. Wrestling, and he jumped on his back and tapped him out instantly. A very good wrestling um, specific grappler in that yeah, he is expecting you to do the wrestling thing and has molded his submission game for what it is around the understanding that you are going to very quickly get to your knees and expose your neck. Mhm. Um and yeah, just dusted him instantaneously. Yeah. And it's uh, I just can't expect um, that not to happen with Almeida. Admittedly, you know, the Abdurakimov fight does there is one thing that happens in it which you might want to which might give you caution which is that he he always starts off with as uh kyle would have talked said if he'd you know if he'd and, if he talked about this yeah. he would have said he always throws like a front kick and then dives into the takedown yeah and uh shemil abdurakimov is quite good against kicks and then just immediately count just counters him as hard as possible on the first kick he throws he caught it and um, rocked almeida in the first five seconds of the fight i mean he rocked him back on his heels and made him stumble mm-hmm. and uh yeah if Derek lewis does that sure maybe but there's there's no reason to assume that he's going to i think is the, yeah. is the main thing yeah and and yeah almeida being perfectly willing to wait as long as need be for the opponent to give their back um, and to just kind of go easy with all the explosions that may or may not come before that um, should be, I think, well suited to deal with Derek Lewis's ground game. Almost funny to say the phrase Derek Lewis's ground <laughs> game. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is that there is a, a slim but not uh, non-existent possibility that this is a fight where I, I am waiting for the day when Jailton Almeida gets punished for his other tendency, which shows up in every fight, which is this man is a shot wrestler. It's front kick shot. It's not stepping into the clinch and hitting a trip. It's not Sergei Spivak's wrestling game. It is a shot wrestling game in which he shoots to his knees every single time. Mm-hmm. He shoots to his knees trusting in the fact that he is going to effectively like lasso the opponent's legs and then he can take his time building back up from a point a position of control with that hold locked on and then finish the takedown um it is rarely the initial shot that uh, bowls people off of their feet um and someday somebody is going to pancake Jalatin almeida with a sprawl 
Somebody's yeah. going to be ready. They're going to pancake him and they're going to get on top. And if that were to happen in this fight, I suspect Almeida will not be easy to control. But if it were to happen, that is one place you definitely do not want to end up against Derek Lewis. Having this big, strong hulk of a man on top of you where he doesn't have to do any guesswork or any footwork to bring the power to bear, we know that Derek Lewis is a juggernaut in top position. He is a destructive force. So there is a, yep. a distinct, if slim, possibility that that is another way this could go wrong for Jonathan Alameda. That or shooting into an uppercut or something like Curtis Blades did. Yeah, or, you know, uh, Almeida just... Was it, he, he just, uh, not Almeida, uh, Lewis just instantly flying the, um, what's his face in his Marco last fight? Marco Jerry DeLima, yeah. Yes. Uh, in a fight he might have actually had some troubles with, with because, like, yeah. DeLima can low kick people and stuff. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, as I said, if, I, I, I just don't think, like, the, the wrestling, he, yeah, I don't think Almeida even needs to be a good wrestler. <laughs> right. He could be a worse wrestler than he is, like, say, Sergei Spivak, uh -huh. and probably hit some takedowns. It's just the fact that it is he is primarily a shot wrestler, that that is not typically the way people get Derek Lewis down, and it is one uh -huh. of the more dangerous ways to... to it's, it's an explosive entrance where you are committing yourself. You're losing your feet, really, yep. in a striking sense, and committing yourself to one direction. It is a risk. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is. I mean, I think that is definitely worth considering. I, I had not really thought of it that much, and yeah, it's entirely possible. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you pretty much just with Derek Lewis getting older and uh, having even less like he hasn't really won any famous Derek Lewis comebacks for a while, right? True. Mostly, he's just getting thrashed or he's instantly Quick, knocking or people out yeah exactly uh in fact yeah he pretty much like his last one was like maybe a linic in 2020 so yeah um you gotta you gotta just pick our mates to tap him and then go on into like the rarefied heights of potential title contention yeah. i mean he's pretty much then it's just like cyril garn who doesn't want to fight anyone and certainly uh, not Almeida. <laughs> There's no way then, he wants to because he doesn't want to fight Blades. Yeah. And then it's just, yeah, it's, it's maybe that they just rebook the Blades fight. Sure. I'll watch Which it. Which is a much more interesting one than this one, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see Almeida versus Gon. I want to, like, I want to see Gon's uh, terrible wrestling getting pressure tested until he's finally forced to improve or just washes out <laughs> because he's so embarrassingly bad at it compared to everything else. But, um, yeah, I think he's going to do everything he can to avoid the now two actually effective wrestlers there are in this division. Well, three, I suppose, if John Jones. Uh, is yep. going to continue to rain or not. We don't know. But, uh, yep, got to pick Almeida by submission. Possibly by the end of the first round. Possibly a little later than that, but... Um, yep. Okay. Well, anything else in this card? Just to basically uh, mention quickly, we have uh, Gabriel Bonfim versus Nicholas Dalby, the man we thought was the worst Bonfim brother. Before uh, Ismail was uh, soundly dusted in his last fight. Um, yeah, I think there is definitely a look at like them trying to sell the Bonfim brothers as a kind of as a kind of duo. But yeah, I thought he looked good against Alakov. This is, I mean, both of them have been booked in sort of broadly similar matchups against mid card action fighters. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a step up from that because, I mean, Dolby, he can be a sort of mid-card action fighter, but one thing Dolby really is is, like, rugged and difficult to finish and willing to have a horrible, ugly fight if that's the way to win. Mm -hmm. And on a three-fight win streak against very credible uh -huh. opposition. Nicholas Dolby just will not die. He's had a couple yep. of downs in his career. He just keeps coming back and, like, renewing his discipline and again, if it means having a terrible uh, looking fight where he clinches and sort of just mauls his opponent, um, I actually thought he looked better than he has in some time in his last fight. 
Yeah. Well, was... I mean, genuinely, I think he's looking like he's in his prime at the moment. Yeah, he was super aggressive with the striking. I mean, yeah, he was just all over Muslim Salikov. So um, I don't have a super clear read on this fight yet. You're going to hear a much more extensive breakdown from me when it comes to the uh, the MMA Viva section this week. But, uh, yeah, do you are you leaning one way or the other? Uh, I'm not really sure at the moment. I mean, I'd, I'm kind of leaning towards, like, the new Dalby, just because he's so grimy. Yeah. I'm still not sure how much, um, I'm still not sure how much, like, Bonfim is going to enjoy maintaining that kind of pace. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, difficult to say. I mean, Bonfim, again, like, this is someone who, who, uh, again, I didn't think was that good, but then I think is, is looking much better than I gave him credit for. Yeah. But um, yeah, I just think I, I do really think that Dolby is a, a step up in terms of well-roundedness and experience and toughness. Um, I really don't have a super clear read on how like durable Bonfim is. Not, and I'm not just talking about physical durability, but in a tough, protracted fight. Because uh, what we've seen from him so far is either something really explosive and impressive in round one. Or him sort of exposing an obvious gap in his opponent's game like he did to Trevin Giles. Mm -hmm. um, and I just don't think those openings are there against Dolby. So yep. I'm, I'm kind of leaning Dolby, too, in a, in a vague way. But yeah, uh, there's just like a, as you said, there's, as I said, there's just like a ton of fights where they're all just reasonably interesting. You know, as I said, Ismail Bonfim, Vince Pichel, again. I think Pichel, perhaps not as good as Dalby. He's just someone, but he is broadly well-rounded and hits super hard. Mm -hmm. he's, um, he's old. Adolfo, but he's, Vie he's Adolfo a... Vieira, another one who's been impressing us lately against Armand Petrosian. A tough fight, actually, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, another yeah. tricky one. Abus Magomedov, the second best middleweight in the, in the world, right. who did better than, uh, as we agreed, did better against uh, Israel Adesanya than shame to uh, see sorry him, did uh, did better than, uh, against Sean Strickland than shame to see did. him uh, knocked down from main event status which he originally deserved mm -hmm. to now be absolutely buried on the uh, the bottom half of the main card. I mean, what happened? This guy's at least at least Caio Baraglia will be getting a title shot if he wins. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> uh, we got our boy Modestus Bacalcus gets back. We've got uh, David Anama. In another silly action fight. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like it's a good, fun, uh, like, night of the fight. But, yeah, everyone is simply at the same level of relevance unless you really like yeah. unless you really like heavyweights, in which yeah. case you'll be like, man, I'm really excited about Jail to now made a rocketing path up through the heavyweight division. Right. But, you know, you know, if nothing else has taught us... <laughs> uh, if we've been taught nothing else in recent memory, it's just like, we, don't get too excited about how good heavyweights we're are. We're going to, as much as we try to armor ourselves against it, we are going to be continue to be tricked by heavyweights. We are going to, I think, for the rest of our lives, <laughs> as long as we continue mm -hmm. watching combat sports, we are going to have high expectations for a heavyweight, no matter how much we try to hedge and then just have them exposed as like not knowing something very obvious <laughs> about how to fight. Mm -hmm. That's just how it goes. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, Tom Aspinall's going to like fight someone in uh, like a top 15 ranked last minute replacement as a, like a, as a, um, and you know, Aspinall is now the champion at this point. Yeah. And he's going to fight this like fat, rubbish guy who's barely won his fights and then the other guy the the other guy's gonna like switch to southpaw or something yeah and you'll just see this look of absolute panic <laughs> yeah. in Aspinall's face yeah he's gonna Aspinall's gonna end up losing the title to a short notice replacement uh oh my god I'm blanking on his name who's our filthy favorite um Saperbeck Saperol yeah he's gonna end up losing to Saperbeck yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. TKO parentheses Greece. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think that'll do it for this week's episode of Heavy Hands. Another big thanks to Kyle McLaughlin. He obviously didn't, couldn't be bothered to talk about the MMA aspect 
of uh, of things this week. But hey, he gave us uh, almost enough uh, as far as the <laughs> uh, the heavyweight boxing showdown was concerned. We look forward to having him back the next time something uh, big enough to warrant our attention happens in the boxing sphere. And next week we'll be back to talk about hopefully the best of what happens on a um, in action terms a promising fight night card. And also we will be looking forward to UFC 295, which is not great for a pay per view, but does have Yuri Pachowska versus Alex Pereira for the main event, and that will certainly be a lot of fun to break down. Um, until then, another thanks to Kyle. Make sure you check out Combat Chronicles. Great podcast. Support that man on Patreon. Support us on Patreon. We had a a, um, a, a belated Edson Barboza celebration along with a big undercard breakdown uh, posted there last week. And uh, also find us on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson, at Boxing Bush. You can find me at King Typo, also over on Blue Sky. As Twitter continues to consume itself, we'll see if that one takes off or not. I'm hardly posting on either at the moment, but uh, you can still find me online if you need to. Otherwise, thank you all so much for listening. And if you came here for the finer points of face punch and you came to the right place, this has been Heavy Hands. Try and maybe uh, as the outro is playing out, you could try and get a little bit of my maybe after the music's played at the end of the podcast, you could get a little bit of my Almeida uh, Lewis analysis in there. That'd be quite a bit of an in joke, maybe just sort of prove that I wasn't lying, that we did actually talk about it. Maybe just me saying their names would be enough just to prove it. Do you know what I mean? I not me telling you uh... to do your podcast or anything, but people are not going to believe me now. They're going to go, look, Kyle was checking out talking about the, the big heavyweight fight that we all want everyone to yeah, talk about. Yeah, the real, the real fight. Yeah. Of... yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs>